Okay, so let's all be honest here. By its end, Kia Kia Pre Cure had devolved into a total train wreck. Which is a shame, because in the beginning, it did show a lot of promise with a solid base for a good season. Ichiko was an amiable lead, Himari was absolutely adorable, Aoi brought some good Sinful gear esh charm, and Yukari and Akira were one of the most overt examples of Yuri coupling in all of Precure. Seriously, I didn't even really have to make jokes about it, the creators knew what they were doing with these two. But yeah, for about the first half of this anime, up until like the early parts of the Grave arc, the show still had some potential to be good. However, by its end, it felt like only two of its main characters had gone through significant character arcs, while others either felt like their arcs were incomplete or they didn't have one to begin with. And that's not even bringing up how convoluted the latter story arcs became. I could go into length about that stuff, but I think I've said enough already, and really, I don't want to have to remember a lot of it. Thankfully, when the first few chapters of the manga adaptation were published, the authors, remember we're dealing with Twin Sister Mangaka here, didn't adapt any of the anime stories, and instead just used like the first 25 episodes or so as a basis to write brand new stories. And again, the first half of the anime was semi-good, kind of. The second volume follows suit, and considering how ludicrous the latter half of the anime became, they wisely chucked out any plot points from there out the window, and instead wrote a whole bunch of their own original stories. Spoilers, no cure pecorin, thank god. Still, would the Kamikita Dago be able to write up a good manga pretty much all on their own? Well, let's take a look at the second volume of the Kia Kia Pre-Cure Manga Adaptation to find out. <laughs> The manga starts off with a little story recap by Aoi, basically explaining how Shiel had recently joined their team and how much stronger they had become because of her. Oh, and then there was that whole thing with that dominatrix chick who almost melted herself along with Akira down into a giant cheese fondue. Why wasn't that story ever adapted into the anime? However, Aoi herself wasn't feeling all that peppy. Shiel suggested she sing a song to raise her spirits. Yeah, just don't sing this one song off the Sweet Precure soundtrack. Even though I think it's one of the best songs on that CD. But no, as it turns out, Aoi wasn't in the mood to sing. As it turns out, her band had grown tired of how much time she was spending at the Kirapati instead of practicing, as well as the fact that most of the song lyrics she had written were more at home in a Willy Wonka number. Thus, they gave her an ultimatum, quit the Kirapati or the band would break up. Choosing between sweets and banned. Pretty sure Hokago Tea Time would have disbanded on day one if that were the choice. The stress of the whole situation left Aoi unable to even play her guitar properly. <laughs> she all tried to cheer up by suggesting that maybe she could just do both, quoting the proverb, the man who chases two rabbits acquires double the happiness, not realizing that the proverb actually goes, the man who chases two rabbits catches neither. Considering how rabbits have been treated in recent anime, I'd say the best number of rabbits to chase is actually zero. <laughs> Regardless, she also suggests Aoi refresh herself with her favorite treat. For Aoi, that's of course ice cream, which she wasn't up for making, but because of that, she did get inspiration to make a brand new treat. She made some homemade soda using sodium and filled the cups with specially shaped ice cubes laced with citric acid to produce a very fizzy carbonated drink. Yeah, another thing I really like about this manga, it's how creative they are with their recipes. While I certainly had fun making the anime's recipes, I will admit, they kind of lacked an edge. I don't know, they just didn't seem quite as out of the box as I would have expected from a magical girl anime. Here though, they're making homemade soda. That, for a lack of better term, is pretty cool. Aoi shares a new creation with her bandmates using the ice and soda to illustrate the symbiotic nature of her love for both music and sweets. Her bandmates admit defeat and agree to allow her to continue doing both. Thus, the chapter ends with her band playing a gig and Aoi giving a little wink to Shiel, thanking her for giving her the inspiration she needed. The next chapter opens with... five new characters. No, actually, these are our main characters. Apparently, cross-dressing cafes were trending, so the Kiapati crew decided to hop on the bandwagon. Yeah, cross-dressing manga have pretty much become their own genre at this point. Oh no, Hideyoshi doesn't count. After all, we all know what Hideyoshi's true gender is. Hideyoshi 
Yeah, and interestingly enough, the one character who was actually voiced by a former member of the Takarazuka Review wasn't dressed yet. As it turns out, Akira doesn't even consider what she normally wears as cross-dressing. She just wears what she thinks suits her best. Huh. You know, that's actually an interesting little character detail. Again, I must ask, why was it stuff like this in the anime, you know, as opposed to the excessive amount of focus on her relationship with Miku? So they sail on the standard butler attire, but after an accidental spill by Ichika, Akira pulled a Hayate and got her clothes dirty as a result. This of course left everyone the Kiapati concerned, especially Akira's customers, and OH MY GOD IT'S THE TRUE FORMS OF THE AKIRA FAN CLUB! I KNEW THOSE GIRLS WERE ALIENS ALL ALONG, BUT NOBODY BELIEVED ME! WELL, WHO'S THE CRAZY ONE NOW?! So, continue along. Akira comes back out washed up and in just a white shirt and jeans. And in spite of the very plain and simple attire, apparently the fresh out of the shower look proves to be a big hit. Hey, I was just taking a shower. This gave Ichika the inspiration to make a new dessert. Just like Akira, she made what looked like a plain old chocolate cake, but turned out to be my all time favorite dessert ever, chocolate lava cake. You know, I was considering putting a clip from the 2014 film Chef here to explain why this is the greatest dessert on the planet, but I think the new YouTube algorithms don't like it when I use any swearing in my videos, so I'll just let you look up the lava cake scene for yourself. It's Sean Favreau having a mental breakdown, how could you not want to see that? But yeah, this turns out to be a basic, just be who you want to be sort of story. Just as long as you're a good person in the end, that's all that really matters. Which, much like the cakes themselves, makes this chapter a simple yet sweet one. <laughs> Next up is a sweet science theme chapter, so of course we get more of everyone's favorite squirrel girl, outside of Marvel. The Kiripati wanted to produce a new sweet that could help improve people's relationships with one another. For this, Himari decided to make a treat full of phenacelamine, or PEA. It's an organic compound often referred to as the love drug as it's known to stimulate people's emotions, in particular, their fondness for one another. And as it just so happens, it's often found in Akia's signature treat, chocolate, which they had plenty on hand. However, a little slip up sends Himari head first into the chocolate bath. Hey, good for you Himari, you didn't even have to travel all the way to Pennsylvania for that special treatment. No, but Aoi managed to save her before she becomes another treat for Salty Pepper. Before she did though, Himari swallowed a significant amount of chocolate, and the PEA apparently started to take effect. I think they should just make a full on dock for all the ships the Kamikita Futago keep deploying. Though, before she could give the fanfic writers too many ideas, Himari runs away and into a tree just like a squirrel. Akira is about to call the fire department when Yukari decides to take care of things her way. She gives her some mint lemonade to calm her down a little. With a cleared head, Himari was able to admit that she was unable to fully process her feelings towards Aoi. She wasn't sure if she should feel happy, embarrassed, all she knew was that the whole thing was making things awkward between the two. Why are you coming back to me for? I can't really add to this. This is good stuff. However, Yukari assures her that's probably not the case, as Himari's belief in science probably produced a placebo effect when she ingested the chocolate. Himari herself admitting that was likely the case. Regardless, it was still a good learning experience for her and made her appreciate food science even more. So yeah, that was actually a nice way to end this chapter, and it was all thanks to Yukari who is feeding Akira chocolate in this last panel here. You know, I'm starting to think this kitty would have made for a much better antagonist than the ones we actually got. Granted, that's not a hard task, but still. Now, this next chapter is probably going to open up all of the cans of worms, but we'll get to that at the end. The chapter opens with Chiel judging the newest sweet creep by the entire Kirapati staff. Of course, as a strict critic, she tells them it still needs work, but does at least compliment the team for being able to work together and apply each of their own specialties to the dessert. Jeez, stuff like that sounds like it could have made for an interesting plot point in the anime. You know, like in battle. But nah, why bother? Aoi notices a letter from France addressed to Xiao. I'm guessing they're currently at Xiao's shop instead of the Kirapati. It was an invitation to a sweets contest being held in Paris. Everyone is of course amazed by the fact that Xiao had been invited to what could be considered the Olympics for past years. 
Shiel, however, was still on the fence on whether or not she wanted to participate, and just as she says this, her stomach crawls and she reverts back into her fairy form due to a lack of calories. While replenishing her strength, she recalled her times in Paris and learning under Jean-Pierre, her master who we've seen in a few flashbacks in the anime. She held a man in the highest of regards and wasn't sure if she wanted to enter the sweets contest because of that. Oh, not because she was afraid of losing in front of the guy, but rather because she was afraid she'd beat him and might hurt the guy's pride. Uh, hey Shiel, I've got a brand new recipe I think you should try out sometime. It's called Humble Pie. Itsuka suggested that if she were worried about her master's feelings, then maybe she should seek answers from a master of a similar enough variety. Thus, Ichika takes her back to her house and introduces her to her dad, who Xiao already knows, much to Ichika's surprise. Yeah, again, this is pretty much confirmation that this manga takes place in a different continuity than the anime, as Ichika was indeed present when Xiao met Genichiro for the first time. I only bring this up because it kind of plays into the ending of this chapter. Anyway, since he was in the middle of a class, Xiao decided to take part before questioning him. Without giving him any exact details, she'll ask him how he'd feel if one of his students were to ever surpass him. Would it make him sad or hurt his pride? To which Genichiro responds by pretty much saying his students were his pride. He simply believed that any good teacher would want to see his students constantly improve themselves to the point they'll eventually far surpass their teachers. It's good stuff that again proves that Genichiro is best pre cure dad. At least a lot better than these a-holes. With that, Shell makes up her mind and decides to enter into the contest to show Jean-Pierre how much she's grown. However, she wasn't going to go out alone as she was going to take the entire Kirapati staff with her to Paris. They exactly accept her invitation and we're off to France to an adventure that won't be covered in this manga. Yeah, as a few of you have likely already figured out, this whole chapter has pretty much been a prologue to the Kira Kira Precure movie. Now I'm sure the Kamikita photographer just commissioned my toy to write this chapter advertising the movie, but if we were to take this at face value, that would mean that the movie takes place in the same continuity as the manga-verse. And since the Mahotsukai team appeared in that movie, does that mean that their series also takes place in this continuity? For that matter, when was the first time they met? Was it in Dreamstar since they acted like that was the first meeting between the two teams, as well as the Princess Precure team? Because if that's the case, that kind of negates their first meeting at the final episode of Mahotsukai. And also, what does that mean for Superstars? Are the Futai Precure crossover coming later this year? Or- Don't oh, know, I've gone cross-eyed. Okay, okay, I know I'm kind of overthinking this. After all, Toei hasn't had the- best track record when it comes to their continuities. So let's just wrap this manga up with one last chapter. The chapter opens with something I'm really surprised never appeared in the show proper, a very obese pecorine. Seriously, when you peck away that many sweets, you're either gonna rot away all of your teeth or look like the bird from Tomoko Market. Well, alright, to be fair, it's not just because she's been eating too many sweets, but also everything. I mean, I can see a steak, a turkey leg, some stew, and of course you need some gravy and bread to go with all that. Seriously, I know I'm a little overweight, but seeing this much food is just giving me heartburn. To figure out why she was packing on the pounds, the team decided to hold a slumber party so that Pecorine could more easily air out her grievances. And of course, the authors were looking for any excuse to dress up the girls in cute PJs. I mean, no complaints here. Though, for someone who was noted for preferring masculine clothing a couple chapters back, Akira is wearing some very... interesting attire. Anyway, through some girls talk at the end of the night, they learned the reasoning behind Pecorine's gorging was because she had an unrequited crush on a pretty boy and was stress eating as a result. Okay, I didn't expect the little fairy dog to go into this uncomfortable teen drama territory, but again, still better than Cure Pecorine. The girls agreed to act as Pecorine's wingmen and spend the day trying to look for her crush. According to Pecorine herself, he wore some kind of pig accessory. Piggy, piggy, pig! On a side note, I absolutely love Akira's delivery here. <laughs> you guys knew what you were doing! They do eventually find a boy with a pig pendant on his collar. Oh, I don't mean his shirt collar, I mean his. collar. collar. Yeah, Pecorine fell in love with a. Golden Retriever. Okay, I was kind of joking when I called Pecorine a dog fairy earlier because I honestly don't know what the hell she's supposed to be. Is she a dog or is she something else? Is this right or is it wrong? You know what, never mind. I won't push this subject any further. I mean, it's not until this chapter is going to throw us any more curveballs our way.
I just raised a really bad flag, didn't I? Anyway, with Christmas around the corner, Pecori managed to set up a date with her canine boyfriend. However, before the date, she wanted to look her best and needed to lose a few dozen pounds. I smell a train montage! Christmas arrives, and as her gift to the retriever, Pecorine presents some piglet cupcakes. Okay, seriously, what is this series' obsession with feeding sweets to animals? I mean, yeah, they mentioned earlier that it was safe for dogs and everything, but why would you ever want to share in eating a sweet that has almost no sugar in it? Also, on a side note, these cupcakes were actually inspired by the winner of a contest held in the pages of Nakayoshi, the magazine the Precure manga are serialized in. It was just a drawing contest, so they didn't actually have to bake anything, which is a bit of a shame as even I managed to bake something. But whatever, I guess these things are cute enough, and they do match up with the dog's pendant. Which, speaking of which, why does this dog have a pig pendant? I mean, if I didn't know any better, I'd think he was in love with a pig. Uh. Oh, that's not right. No. So, yeah, Pecorine gets NTR'd by a pig. That happens. Well, anyway, the chapter ends with Pecorine admitting that she still had a good time, and at the very least was able to taste the bare sweetness of a first love. A uh, first love in a three-way interspecies relationship, but yeah. Well, that was an unusual chapter to close out on. But still, while this second volume wasn't quite as good as the first, it's still a pretty solid adaptation, all things considered. First, let's get this out of the way. You might have noticed something kinda missing from this Precure manga. There was no actual Precure action outside of Aoi's introduction at the beginning. I mean, yeah, that was also kind of the case for the early half of the first volume, but at least there were still signs that they were working as Precure in that one. Not so much here, as they instead decided to focus on more of the slice of life aspects of the series. With that said though, I'm not necessarily against such a decision. I mean, let's face it, as a Precure team, Kirakira was never quite able to deliver, especially in the action department. But some of their slice of life episodes were pretty good. As a result, I imagine that Kamikita Futago just decided to double down on it and give much needed character focus to guys who really needed it. Aoi's chapter produced some much more believable band drama than in the anime, at least one of her band members didn't suddenly decide to become a doctor. Akira's chapter gave her actual justification for why she dresses like a guy all the time. Yukari managed to play a supportive older sister role to Himari and her dedication to food science. Shio. While she really didn't need that much development, did receive a good message about how a student-teacher relationship should work. And yeah, jokes about interspecies relationships aside, it wasn't bad actually seeing Pecorine have an actual character and goals. So, as a pre manga, it's honestly nothing that great, but as a slice-of-life manga, it's pretty good, especially when they tie it back to the themes of cooking. I love how they apply actual techniques and even bring up food science. No joke, I took time to look up PEA and was fascinated by it, so good job there, manga, for teaching me something. And all this is made even better thanks to the great art by the Kamikitas and their excellent fashion sense. Seriously, how did they make Akira in a plain shirt look that awesome? I do have a few more things I want to say about this manga, but we'll save that for when I talk about the second half of it in due time. But before that, I think it's high time we paid our respects to something truly beloved in the Precure fandom. With the Infinity War on the horizon, why don't we take a look at how Precure did first, and if they end up doing it better. 